Who do you value and who values you? We're talking about one of the most important elements of family living, and that is honoring each other. How do we go about honoring each other within a family? We see that in Romans 12, 10, it's a Christian value because it says we are to give an honor, give preference to one another. In other words, it would be more important to see other people get honored than to be honored ourselves. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 to 20, and to read that as our scripture this morning. You follow along as I read. Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrive from Jerusalem to Jesus, and they ask him, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. Now, this was not hand-washing. We're not talking about absolute physical cleanliness here. We're talking about ceremonial washing, a ritual that was going on there. They're saying, you're not teaching your disciples right. You're not teaching them to follow our age-old tradition. Why are you doing that? And Jesus comes back at them and says... And why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandment of God? For instance, God says, honor your father and mother. Well, that's one of the commandments. And later on he says, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. But you say, it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you in this way. You say that they don't need to honor their parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. He wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They, their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. And then Jesus called the crowd to come and hear Listen, he said, and try to understand. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. And then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you said? Jesus replied, Every plant not planted by my heavenly Father will be uprooted, so ignore them. They are blind guides leading the blind. And if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. Then Peter said to Jesus, Explain to us the parable that says people aren't defiled by what they eat. Don't you understand yet? Jesus said. Anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes out into the sewer. But the words you speak come from the heart. That's what defiles you. From the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. These are what defiles. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. Let's pray. Fathers, we study your word. It is not merely with an academic interest. We're not merely passing time. But Father, we have come to commands. We have come to the commander. We have come to our Lord and Master to ask for orders. We're not going to consider what you've said, we've come to do it. So Father, we pray that as we read your word, that you will teach us how to do this in our homes, how to do this in our church. And Father, that you will give us the wisdom to do your will in our lives. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Honor your father and mother. There's the word honor. What does that word mean? Well, first of all, the word honor meant to value something. That is, to put a monetary price upon it. Did you ever buy anything where you haggled? You ever been to a place where they haggle over things? I mean, that could be really fun. As long as you're serious about buying, you're saying, I think it's worth this, and they said, no, I think it's worth this. I, I remember buying a car, looked up the price, and had the price in mind, and went to them, and you know, I, just what I was going to offer, and they, they offered it to me for $1,000 less than I was going to offer them which threw me off. You know, usually you say, well, I'll drop, five, drop 500 off of that. And it's kind of like, well, oh, that's a lot more less than I was going to offer. So I guess I'll have to buy it. Uh, they, out, they outdid me. But you put the value on something. That's the word. To honor something is to put a price upon it. What price would you put on Jesus? 
30 pieces of silver. That's the honor, that's the value they put upon him. Matthew chapter 27, verse 9. They valued him as being worth no more than 30 pieces of silver. A lot of times the world does that. A lot of times we do that. We look at people for whom Christ died and say, you're not very valuable. That's saying you're worth about 30 pieces of silver. We can really mess up the price on things, can't we? You look at your family. What's the value of your family compared to the stuff you have? You see, in this world, we're, we're taught to mess up our value system. Rather than recognizing nothing that I have will last for eternity. I'm just hoping it'll last the next 30 years. You know, if, if they slide me in a coffin about the time the house falls down, you know, I, I, I'll consider I'll have won. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, not unless I give it my full attention for the next 30 years. I don't think the house is going to stand up. We value things that will not last for eternity. They're all going to melt with a fervent heat. They're all going to corrode, corrupt. But the people around us this morning will be somewhere for all eternity. Jesus calls us to change our value system. Honor means value. How much do you value someone? Well, if you honor someone, then you respect them. You compensate them according to their value. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, Elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. They should be respected and paid well. They're translating this word honor, the same word. It's the idea of honoring someone. How much do you value someone? We are in the process of trying to figure out how to honor somebody, how to respect them, how to give them the honor they need. Well, if you don't spend money on people, you don't honor them very much. Husbands who honor their wives don't mind buying them things like food and clothing and things of that nature. You put a value, a monetary value. You put a respect value. Have you ever been guilty of speaking to family members in ways you would never speak to a neighbor? Just the tone, maybe what you're saying, the way you're saying it. When you honor someone, you respect them. We're going to talk a little more about that. Let me tell you a little bit about the context here. Jesus is teaching that the commands of men do not trump the command of God. In other words, piety is never a substitute for obedience. They were trying to be very pious people. God says, honor your father and your mother. That's the commandment. They were saying, hey, there's a way around that. You say, verse 5, your parents need some help? Sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. What are they saying? You're not as important to me as my piety. They're not saying you're not as important to me as God and God's temple. By the way, they had not given it to God's temple. They had just devoted it to God's temple. It's different. They weren't saying, well, you know, I would have helped you, but every dime I have, I have given to the temple. I am now broke. They're just saying, what you would like to have, I have devoted that to the temple. So I can't give it to you because in my piety, I have honored God with it. And you wouldn't want me to violate what I had pledged to God, would you? Hypocrites. Hypocrisy. God says you are to honor people in your family. Particularly, he uses the example here of honoring your parents, your father and your mother. So how do we do that? Look down at verse uh, 18. The words that you speak come from the heart. Why is it important how you honor other people? Because it has a reflection of your heart and where you're coming from your heart. You see, how we speak to other people, how we treat people in our families has to do with our heart, what's coming out of our heart. Every problem you and I have is a problem of the heart. Our heart, somebody else's heart, because we're all sinful people. And we've all got to learn, how do you do this honor thing? How do you show respect to other people? How does that work? Well, let's look at that. Let's think about how do we honor our parents we talk about at least six ways that I have found in Scripture for us to honor our parents and honor one another in the family. How does a husband treat his wife? How does the wife respect her husband? How about your children? 
How do we do this in terms of honoring our children? How do we show honor to our children? So you can jot some of these down. Look in this passage before we move. In verses 4 through 6, he talks about we honor them by financial help. We take our finances to honor particularly our parents, as he's talking about here. God had commanded to honor your parents. That doesn't mean just to obey your parents, although that's implied there. and We'll talk about that later. But there comes a time in the life of your parents where you have to step up and help them. Somewhere along the line, things change. I remember one lady talking about it. I did not realize that the change had taken place. It happens gradually sometimes until a car pulled out in front of me and I hit the brakes and my hand went out in front of my mother to keep her from hitting the dash. And I thought, whoa, when did that happen? You see, somewhere along the line, if your parents live long enough, you're going to have to take care of them some way, somehow. Financial help. That's what he was saying here. We've talked about the use your fract law in Louisiana. It's a great law if you're a parent. Now, some people would object and say, wait a minute. The Bible says parents are supposed to lay up, put back money for their children. 2 Corinthians 12, 14. He says, now I'm coming to you the third time and I will not be a burden to you. I don't want what you have. I want you. After all, children don't provide for their parents. Rather, parents provide for their children. We're supposed to lay up. We're supposed to try to leave a financial inheritance to our children. We're trying to bless them financially with whatever we can, trying to lay up and provide for them. Most of us did go to work because we had children. Whoever told us that lie about two can live as cheap as one didn't understand finances, math, or multiplication. And we're up to nine now. We're from two people to nine, like that. The reason you go to work is so you have money for the children. They need clothes, they need school, they need food, they need a house, they need more house. And you got to go to work to provide because you want to raise up good children. That's the job of parents. You're taking care of your children. That, that's the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to provide for them. That's a good, honorable, right thing to do. You're honoring them. You're saying, you are worthwhile. I'm going to take care of you. But it turns around at some point. And the Apostle Paul goes on to say in 1 Timothy 5, 4, somebody has children, a woman has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. That is something that pleases God. Sooner or later, it's going to turn around to where you have to take care of your parents. It's just as godly as taking care of your children, taking care of your wife, taking care of your husband, when it comes time to take care of your parents, to decide what's best for them. And I've got a whole lot of insights on that, thoughts on that, mostly biblical, but not during this sermon. So many details in regard to that and so much of a change of thinking that has to take place for you to do that successfully. But when the time comes, talk to me and I'll, I'll try to walk you through some of that. One you take care of somebody, you honor somebody when you help them financially when they have a need. That applies to family. We understand that. It also applies to other people in the church. Secondly, second way that we honor is we honor when we have respectful speech. Chapter 15, verse 4, he talks about people that curse mother and father. Cursing means disrespectful. That's why it's translated that way in this version. The opposite of being disrespectful is to speak respectfully. See how I got there? Some people curse their father and do not thank their mother. You know you can be disrespectful without ever uttering a curse word toward your parents when you don't thank them. When you discount their influence in your life. Some of you may have grown up with unsaved parents. In fact, you may have grown up with parents that are hostile to the gospel. Had no intention whatsoever of, of preparing you to be a Christian. May may not like the fact that you are a Christian today. Dr. Howard Hendricks talks about his father, who had, was a reserve officer in the military, and he said he had no intention of training me for the ministry. He wasn't a believer, hated the fact I went in the ministry, had no intention, but he said he prepared me for ministry. Why? Because God picked him out for me. God has selected the parents you need. They're quirky, like you. They understand you. You know, one of the most aggravating things about being a father is seeing your foibles in your children. And you know that's where they got that from. And then you begin to wonder, where did I get that from? And 
the expression, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, kind of answers that question. Never underestimate the influence your parents have on you. If for nothing else, you owe them honor because you are here instead of nowhere. Some of you have, let's use the word lousy parents that raised you, still worth honor. Maybe not as much honor as if they had been good parents, caring parents, honoring parents, but they're still a value. Don't ever, as one president said, misunderestimate the value of your parents and be thankful for what they did and how they have had an influence on your life. As it says in Proverbs 30, 11, some people curse their father and do not thank their mother. He's talking about two opposite sides of that. You can curse, but it's like a curse when you're not thankful. If you're watching the videos that go with this, and I encourage you to do that, particularly the ones for today, it's worth going to Grace 101 and logging in and watching the video for today. But the one last week, a father coming to recognize just how tough it is to be a mother, a stay-at-home mom with kids and all the mama, 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 mama things that go along with that. Do you thank your mother and father for their influence? on you? Do you honor them and recognize they have had a great influence upon you? Let's turn this around and look the other way. You ever thank your children, at least for showing you where you fail? <laughs> and you've, you have helped me to see how much I offend God. Do you ever honor your children because they're turning into good people? Cursing, blasphemy, that's speaking bad about somebody harping on their faults, or saying sometimes unfair things. When we're in the heat of an argument, we tend to say things that if we had thought about it, we don't really mean it the way we said it. We might even have used the words, but we wouldn't have used that attitude in speaking to you about things. Dishonor also involves the practice of being two-faced. That is, speaking one way in front of one's parents and another way behind their back. Psalm 62.4 talks about that. They praise me to my face, but they curse me in their hearts. How do we do this? Well, it's a matter of the heart and the attitude that comes out of our mouth. What starts here, do you really value the people in your family? Enough to speak respectfully to them, to talk about them in a smart way. Parents sometimes will say to a child who is not getting things as quick as they ought to or you would hope they would, why are you so stupid? Boy, that's uplifting, isn't it? Respectful? No, not respectful. Sometimes we say it more politely. Poor Gene, he's just not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And that's motivational, isn't it? You know, you can't help it. You're doing the best you can. It's just not going to be good enough. Sorry about that. Sometimes we treat the baby in the family as dumb. Well, of course they're dumb. They're y you're younger than everybody else. They, they're trying to catch on to everything else going along. I was watching Home Improvement with Tim Allen one time. One of his sons, I think it was the oldest son, was trying to learn to play the trumpet or something, and he was terrible. It was just driving them crazy. They just, you ever had somebody learn, trying to learn something and you just cringe? But he said to his son, you know, who finally came to him and said, Dad, do I really stink at this? He said, for a guy who's only been playing a week, you're not so bad. You know, a, a, an eight-year-old is not going to be able to do what an 18-year-old can do. It's just not possible. You're just not going to get it now. It's going to take you a little while longer. Don't worry about it. You're a smart person. You'll get it. If you want to get it, you can get it. You'll be able to do this. Hang in there. You can do anything you want to do as long as you're willing to pay the price that's required for that. You can do it. My dad used to tell me, son, you can do anything you want to do. And he really wanted me to do something else besides this. You know, he said later, I'm, I'm glad you did it, but he said, I want you to do something else. I want you to go run a company or something. I didn't want you to do this. And, well, you know, he was trying to aim me at something better, something more, and something I could do. And so, you know, that's good. That's good. It makes you think, well, okay, I can do whatever I want to do, and then let God decide what it is he wants you to do. Because God will lead you to what he wants you to do if you're willing to do that. We honor by financial resources. We honor by speaking respectfully. We honor our parents by heeding their teaching. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. 
Honor your father and mother. Same thing. This is the first commandment with a promise. In other words, it's not the first commandment. It's the first one that contained a promise. What's the promise? If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on the earth. If you don't honor your father and mother by obeying, they'll probably take you out themselves. And that will shorten your life. No, you'll probably lose your life because you're too dumb. Whole nother sermon. Did you ever talk to your children and think the dog is getting this quicker? <laughs> the dog is paying better attention? You know, if, if you listen but you don't heed what they're saying, you're just letting go in one ear and out the other. To know it but not do it is as bad as not knowing it in the first place. Jesus told this story. He said, Tell about a man that had two sons. He said, one son, go work in the field. And he said, I'm not going. But then later on, the son repented and, and changed his mind. And he went out and worked in the field that day. The other one said, well, I'm going. But he didn't. Which one did the will of his father? That was Jesus' question. If you hear it, but you don't do it, you don't take it to heart, you don't think about it, you don't compare it with Scripture. You don't think about what God is saying, the direction God may be giving you through your parents. You're ignoring that. It's just as much as if you had a parent say, Son, let me show you how to steal from a store. Come on, I'll take you and I'll show you how to shoplift and get away with it. You need to listen. We honor our parents by heeding their teaching. We honor with our attitude, not just with our actions. That's the next part. You've got to have the right attitude. Romans 12, 10 says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. There's the key. Delight. It's an attitude. If you can value someone enough to take delight, you're going to honor them with respect. It's going to come from the heart and it's going to have the right attitude about it. Uh, one episode of Andy Griffith, he's trying to do marriage counseling. He's trying to counsel this couple. They're always fighting and he gets them to talk nice to each other. And he's driving them crazy, and they say, thank you, dear. Yes, dear. And you can tell they don't mean it. Deep down inside, they want to fight with each other. That's how they interact. You know, it's the only way they know. You can do the things to honor your parents, but if the heart's not there, if you don't delight, if you don't consider them valuable, if you're not doing it from the heart, it's not going to show up as real. And you know why it doesn't show up as real? Because it's not real. If it's not from the heart is not real. Remember Jesus said what's going to corrupt you is from your heart. You can do the outward things, but if it doesn't delight you in the heart, it's worthless. It doesn't honor. It's really great when in a, in a family you can see siblings encourage one another, honor one another, talk good about one another, particularly talking good about one another to other people outside the family. So you ought to, if you got a question about that, you ought to go to my brother. Ask him my sister can help you with that. She's really good at this. That's a really great thing when you can see that develop. And it's so much nicer than some of the things that we say about our stupid siblings. You know, the morons that we live with. You know, when you, when you get to the thing where you can look for, what's this girl good at? What's this guy good at? What's their talent? What has God put in them that's worthwhile? When we can develop that in our children, all of a sudden the family dynamic starts to change. I've never really known anybody that could be mad at somebody that was saying something nice about them to somebody else. It's kind of hard to be mad when somebody's saying, you know, this person's really good. They can sew great. If you got a computer problem, man, this, this kid's good at this. My mom can bake the best. My dad is. And all of a sudden, it kind of changes the dynamics of the family. You start appreciating one another in the family. We also honor our parents and others when we protect them from harm. Paul uses the body analogy in 1 Corinthians 12, 23 and 24 basically to talk about that we're part of a body. It's like in the church we're one body. Try hitting your little finger with a hammer. Every part of you will hurt. You see because we're one body. When we assault one part we're not really helping the rest are we? We're not really honoring the rest. We need to protect one another. He talks about you cover the, the parts of your body that you really don't want any of the people to see. A lot of men of Avoirdupois uh, wear T-shirts when they go to the swimming pool, not for sun protection so much as belly protection. 
you know, if you do a belly flop, you get there a few seconds before the rest of you. You know, all of a sudden you're there. And you say that there needs to be some covering on that to kind of protect that a little bit. You know, if you know that somebody in your family is not really good at something, you try to figure out ways to keep them from being embarrassed by that, to give them, you know, some help or some opportunity. Not You don't hold up the ridicule of, well, they can't do this. Instead, you say, well, let's figure out a way so that that doesn't happen, so that if they make mistakes, they make it in private, they don't make it out in public. Sometimes you do this with, with elderly parents. Uh, you talk to them and say, well, so-and-so is coming over to visit. It's so-and-so that you know, and here's their names, and we'll say, hey, do you remember so-and-so? And, oh, yeah, that's how, nice to see you. And so you were trying to keep them from the embarrassment of, I don't have a clue who these people are. And I don't see how in the world I would be friends with anybody that looked like that, but maybe I was at some point. I, you know, you can't tell. Uh, we protect them. Number six, we ultimately honor our parents when we live honorably. You know why your parents put all that effort into you? They want you to turn out to be a good human being. It's worth all the I'm not going to see you actually doing. Uh, it's not good to say I'm not going, but it's better when you do go, when you do what you really need to be doing. He says that each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor. Honor. Proverbs 10, 1 says, a wise child brings joy to a father, and a foolish child brings grief to a mother. So how do we teach this? How do we get this across in our family? Let me suggest three things. Begin by your example, beginning with your spouse, but also including your children, and how you honor your own parents. If you want your children to honor you, you need to be a person that honors others by the way you speak about them, the way you treat them, the way you act towards them. If you honor your spouse, you speak respectfully to your spouse and about your spouse, whether it's your husband or your wife, you speak about them in a loving manner, respectful manner, it will filter down to your children. If they see you honoring your parents, I mean, they're learning. They're watching, okay, how does this work? How do you do this? If they see you dishonor your parents, they're taking notes. Remember the, the kid that uh, when the elderly grandmother came to live with them and she was a little messy, she couldn't eat without making a mess, so they, the father hewed out a, a wooden trough, sort of a trencher kind of a thing for her to eat out of so it wouldn't matter be a mess. And so, you know, grandma's sitting there and they've got, everybody else got plates and stuff and she's got this trencher and she's sort of eating out of this trough kind of a thing. And, Later on, the father saw the child, you know, carving wood and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm making you a trencher for when you get old. I'm working, you know, I'm making you a trough so you can sit over in a corner and you won't mess up the table. And so that was the last day Grandma sat in the corner. She, from then on, sat at the table as an honored family member. Children are watching. This is taught by example. It's caught. Number one, do it by example. Secondly, since you can't do it by example perfectly because we're all faulty human beings, teach your children what God says. Make sure your children learn the Word of God and understand that God is the authority over you as well as over them. Sometimes you're going to have to make them to understand and tell them, look, I haven't always done this right. I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to be respectful and honoring. I haven't done that in the past. And God has convicted me about that, that I was wrong. And I'm doing what I can to make up for that. So they understand that God is the authority, not you. Because if you're the standard, there's no hope for the world. Right? Amen? If, if people follow you, if your children turn out like you and they do what you're doing, I mean, that's why God gave you the children to show you. You don't want to go on like that, do you? If we're the standard, the world is doomed. But if we're going to follow God and come under God's authority and God can say to us, don't do this and don't do that, and we have to follow that because it's right and good and proper, then there is hope for the world. There's hope things will change in our life, in our church, in our community if we are under God and obligated to follow him. Teach your children what God says and pray hard that they will be better at obeying God than we have been and do everything you can for that. And then finally, repent as necessary. 
you may recognize it's not that I'm not doing right. It's not enough to say, here's what God says. Do what God says. Don't do as I do. We need to confess that I'm doing wrong, and I need to change. I need to do differently than I am doing. I need to treat my parents differently than I treat them now. I need to treat my children differently than I'm treating them now. I need to treat my wife, my husband, better than I'm doing right now. I need to change. Not my brother or my sister. It is me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. I'm the one that needs to change. When it comes down, it's my heart that's the problem. That's when it begins to change. That's when it makes a difference for generations to come in a family. Let's pray. Father, prayer if it's done right, is a very humbling thing. Whether you get on your knees or whether we bow our heads and close our eyes. But Father, when we do it right, when we come to you recognizing we have a problem, we're not holy, righteous, honoring people. There are things we say wrong to our parents, have said wrong to our parents, not done what we should have done. And Lord, when we can confess that we have a problem with honoring others. We're so wrapped up in ourselves. That's what we think about instead of thinking about the value of other people. So, Lord, we come, first of all, to confess not only what we've done wrong, but to recognize the problem is in our own heart. And, Lord, we're not able to deal with us. So we ask you to do it. We ask you, Lord, to bring the conviction as you've done, but also, Lord, it's going to take your spirit working in us to make the change. So, Father, we thank you that you're doing that. That's the reason it bothers us. Lord, you want us to turn to you and say, Lord, I know you can do it, even when I've failed. Father, we pray for our children. Lord, you might reach into their hearts. They were born sinners. They got it from us. And, Lord, unless you open their eyes and open their hearts to faith, they will perish for eternity. And they'll take a lot of people with them. Father, there's very little we can do about that except to tell them the gospel and to pray, Lord, that you will work in their hearts. But, Lord, that's enough. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to doing that. We want our children, our neighbors, to know there is a God who has moved heaven and earth, who sent his own son to die for our sins, to make things right between you and us so that all we have to do is put our faith and trust in him and you'll take it from there and you will save us. Lord, help us as we tell of Jesus who died and rose again to the precious little ones that live in our homes. And Father, you might change their life and heart as Lord, you have begun to change our lives and our hearts. We ask this in Christ's name, amen.